On this episode of What's Going On With Shipping, it's time for episode 55 of What the Ship. Hi, I'm your host, Sal McCogliano. So, top five maritime stories, we're going to go across the spectrum. We're going to go from Russia and Ukraine, we're going to be talking about LNG shipments, and we'll be talking about crab catching up in the Bering Sea. Yep, we're going a little deadly as catch on today's episode. If you're new to the channel, take a moment, subscribe to the channel, hit the bell, so you'll be alerted about new videos as they come out. All right, let's jump into story number one. So story number one takes us to Russia and Ukraine. The grain deal that had been brokered by the UN and Turkey has the potential here for breakdown. This Bloomberg story the other day was following on a trend that Ukraine and many countries were complaining about the backlog in vessels waiting in Istanbul to get up to Ukraine. So what we've seen is faster ship inspections are freeing that backlog. So we're seeing more ships heading up to the three ports around Odessa to get that grain. Now remember, Ukraine had been really halted in shipping grain out ever since the invasion by Russia. Exports went down tremendously because of port closures, but they were able to start getting grain out through a variety of different means, truck and rail, but nowhere near the tonnage they needed. They eventually, once they suppressed Snake Island, was able to open up a route through the Danube River using two Ukrainian ports on the very southern border, along with ports in Romania. They've also changed the gauge on some railways so that now Ukrainian trains can go into Romania and some other countries and drop grain off. And so what you're seeing is an is a uptick in the amount of grain coming out, but it is the grain deal that started in July that is bringing out the most amount of grain, about 50 to 60% of all the grain being exported is coming out of those three ports along the Gulf of Odessa. However, that deal is in jeopardy. This story by Reuters, Ukrainian grain deal renewal is in jeopardy. The Russians agreed to this deal on the basis that they were causing disruptions in grain shipments, particularly to Africa, Asia, and to low-income countries. And so Russia made the, made the agreement that they would allow Ukraine to start shipping grain out of the Gulf of Odessa. Now, let's be clear. They didn't do this out of the goodness of their heart. There was a lot of politics and economics at play here. Turkey that brokered this deal wanted to see these shipments resume. Why? Because Turkey makes 40% of the world's flour and it needed wheat coming out of Ukraine and Russia. And Russia, in turn, got free shipments, or at least uh, guaranteed no attacks on their vessels coming out of the Sea of Azov and the Black Sea by the Ukrainians. But now we're seeing something different. The Russian ambassador to the UN stated this, there's no point in continuing an agreement, one part of which may come out as dead on arrival. So of course, the Russian authorities will be very seriously considering the future of the extension of this grain deal. So this deal may be dying right now. And it really raises the question that I addressed in a previous video, is Russia winning in the Black Sea? Yes, they've suffered huge setbacks, the sinking of Moscow, loss of Snake Island, loss of the uh, oil platforms, the attacks on Crimea. But is do they get more out of the grain deal than the Ukrainians if they can continue to ship their food, fuel, and fertilizer. And if they don't, what is the impetus for them to continue the grain deal? Building on this story, this one, an editorial op-ed, Russian Navy will keep attacking transportation infrastructure. And this tit-for-tat going on between the Russian and Ukrainians has the potential to expand. What am I talking about? Obviously, we're talking about the attack on the Kerch Strait. Uh, did a video on this talking about the Kerch Straits remaining open, and that was a big issue that was uh, discussed. We also talked about the fact that the attacks on Ukrainian cities has escalated, and as you start targeting infrastructure, now the Russians are targeting Ukrainian power infrastructure. What's the next step to hitting commercial vessels in and around the Black Sea. I keep talking about this. This is exactly what happened in the Iran-Iraq War of the 1980s. Eventually, commercial shipping was drawn into that conflict, and we may see that happening in this conflict. All this is leading to soaring dollar uh, value for food as the world is hungry for food and costs are going through the roof. And remember, there are a lot of other factors playing into this right now beyond Russia and Ukraine. We're seeing this across the world. Shipping woes to squeeze China's soybean stock. Uh, China is in desperate need for food. They import large measures of this. 
and China importing it is having some problems. There are delays of grain coming out of the United States to China, which forces China to buy grain on the open market. Why is grain taking so long to come out of the United States and North America? Well, a couple of reasons. One, we talked about way back ago when the Fraser River flooded, it broke the main rail lines going east and west in Canada, and Canada has never caught up with that. There is a massive backlog of bulk carriers off the port of Vancouver. But in the United States, it has to do with the drought. It's the drought on the Mississippi and the Ohio River that's slowing down shipment of grain down the Mississippi and slowing the shipment upriver of fertilizer necessary to put into the soil for next year's crops. And we go in detail talking about that in a previous video, not rolling on the river. So obviously a lot going on here. The amount of impact grain shipments are having both in Russia, Ukraine, demand for it worldwide in Asia and Africa, and the impact in North America and the inability to get it out due to weather conditions, the closing of the Fraser River, the drought that happened in the central part of the United States with the lower Mississippi and Ohio River, all that plays into this situation. All right, let's go ahead and head over to story number two. Story number two deals with global freight. And of course, the issue with the decline in the amount of freight that's moving around the world. This story by Mike Schuller, global, global freight and manufacturing has started to fall. And Mike goes in detail here talking about this kind of freight slowdown that we're seeing. He hits a couple of key points right here. Maritime container volumes handled through the Southern California ports of Los Angeles and Long Beach have been trending lower. The number of loaded containers handled by LA and Long Beach in the three months from June to August was down by 49,000 20, equivalent, uh, 20 foot equivalent units TEUs. Container freight through the port of Singapore was below prior year's level in seven of the 10 months between December of 2021 and September of 2022. Air cargo handled through London's Heathrow was below prior year levels in five of the six months between April and August of 2022. And air ca uh, cargo at Tokyo's Narita was below year level, uh, year uh, prior year levels every month between March and August 2022. We're also seeing manufacturing stalling. Germans' industrial uh, output down 2%. Eurozone manufacturing reported lower business activity. U.S. manufacturing activity has been essentially flat since March, and U.S. manufacturing reported new orders fell in three of the four months between June and September. So all of those stories indicate that global manufacturing, global trade is slowing down. And that is demonstrated by this statistic right here from Lodestar that idle container ship fleet set to grow as market turns. Lodestar is, is tracking this. They're seeing an uptick in the number of vessels jumping from 25 to 76 vessels in this area. What I'll say about this is, is twofold. Number one, I've just done two stories on this move my mug out of the way. So the most recent video I did was this talking about the container volumes drop. And one of the things I did is look at that issue. Are container volumes dropping in the United States? And unlike the, the narrative that you're hearing out there, I, I kind of dispute that a little bit, largely because we're looking at LA and LA isn't the right gauge to be looking at. We have to look at the fact that the first half of the year of 2022 was a stellar year. Matter of fact, it's a record year, 2022 for freight coming in. And a lot of freight got into LA and Long Beach in the first half of 2022 because they wanted to beat, number one, the seasonal rush that happened last year. So they didn't want to wait to the last minute. They also wanted to get in before the July, excuse me, the June, uh, June 30th deadline for the ILWU and PMA labor renegotiation. And since then, since June 30th, what we've seen is a lot of freight shift from the west coast of the united states to the east coast you have that labor dispute in the ports you also have things like ab5 which resulted in strikes and protests in off the port of portland for example you have new emission standards that are going into california as of january 1st which is going to reduce the number of drayage trucks available and more importantly the East Coast and Gulf Coast ports don't have a lot of the restrictions that the port of LA and Long Beach and, and West Coast ports have. And so they're more willing to operate older trucks and develop the ports in a way that LA and Long Beach aren't. And so what we're seeing is a shift of cargo 
coming this way. While it looks like container volumes are dropping, they're just shifting. They're moving to the East Coast, to the ports of New York, New Jersey, and Savannah, and to the Gulf Coast, the port of Houston. But we are seeing falling freight rates. And again, we talked about this in another video. If you look at the Trans-Pacific, something happened that I did not think was happened. But again, that's because I didn't think about this as I should have, is I did not expect Trans-Pacific freight rates to fall below pre-COVID numbers. They have. They're, they're, they're in, uh, in fact, I saw a rate today that's in the high 1,000s, which is insane. But again, most freight now, over 51%, isn't going Trans-Pacific from Asia to the West Coast. It's going from East Asia to the Gulf and East Coast via either the new lane of the Panama Canal that can handle the Neo Panamax vessels or on big, large, ultra large container vessels heading to Europe for transloading in the Mediterranean and Northern Europe over to the United States. And that freight rate, while it's coming down, is still pretty high. And I think that's one of the big issues that we're seeing here. So there was a lot more to that story again, and, and my analysis missed that aspect. However, I do think that what we are seeing is a reaction in the port of LA. LA is way down. Long Beach is not as down as much. Matter of fact, Long Beach took in more containers last month than LA did. So I think that's a big factor, but a lot of shippers are sitting there going, why am I putting stuff into LA and Long Beach? May have a strike, has got all these emission issues, have all these California laws, got to deal with class one railway issues still, because again, there may be a strike coming with class one railway soon. Let me dump in on the East and Gulf Coast. That's closer and I can get away with a much better and reliable freight rate. All right, let's jump over to story number three. Story number three deals with a little bit of a military issue, but it has definite commercial implications. So this story on G Captain uh, by John Conrad, new report says U.S. Navy capacity is very weak. So the Heritage uh, Foundation released their annual basically report on the U.S. armed forces. And basically what the Heritage Foundation said about the U.S. Navy is that it was ranked as, quote, very weak. Now, I'm going to do a separate video this weekend on this that's going to go in more detail about this. But I think this is a very significant issue. Uh, Representative Mike Gallagher, a Republican on the House Armed Services Committee, said this concerning this, the, this decision. For the first time in the history of the Heritage Index, the overall rating of the U.S. Navy was downgraded to weak relative to the force needed to defend national interests on a global stage. But here's the problem. We've tried everything to improve the rating, and none of it seems to work. Now, what I liked about John Conrad's article, besides the fact that he quotes me in it, which, again, you know, just do that, and I like an article. But in truth, the big issue here is he talks about not just that the U.S. Navy is weak, but the U.S. Merchant Marine is in a worse position. And he talks about this issue here in this great chart that shows you sailing distances to from the United States to Europe to Asia all around. And one of the key things is the U.S. Navy has been the guarantor of free shipping or, or, or free sailing on the on the high seas since the end of World War II. Bruce Jones in his great book uh, uh, talks about this and the key issue at play. I literally have Bruce's Joan, uh, Bruce's uh, book right here on my desk, To Rule the Waves. Absolutely a great read. Really recommend it. But he talks about the fact how the U.S. Navy has ensured freedom of the seas, along with allied navies, to do this. However, now the U.S. Navy is basically weaker than ever before, which means that rival navies, China, Russia, and, and a whole slew of other ones, could impinge this. And we're seeing this in other news stories. This story right here from Reuters in G-Captain. Losing Taiwan would jeopardize key shipping lanes, says Japan. Japan's worried about this. Other nations are worried what happens should China basically get more militaristic, demand more control over key areas. And if you seize Taiwan, turn it into a war zone or an area of contention, that chokes Japan. Korea off. Japan, Korea versus China is a nightmare scenario in East Asia. This is the scenario that people should be worried about. People keep worrying about U.S. versus China. You need to worry about the East Asians fighting each other. Those are the group that don't like each other. Those are the group that have historically fought each other in the past. And if you get a war between Japan, Korea, and China, forget about it, let alone the fact they build 93% of the world's ships, and then they get to war with each other, and that would be a 
tremendous mess. It's one of the reasons why you see the U.S. Navy expanding commercial ship protection partnerships with other nations around the world. They have to because there's very little U.S. merchant marine left. I mean, the number of U deep draft U.S. vessels is only about 180, and 100 of those are in the coastwise trade. So there's very few deep water vessels of the U.S. Uh, of the U.S. merchant marine out there, and so the U.S. Navy has to be aware of that. And the weakening of the U.S. military, I would argue goes hand in hand with the weakening of the U.S. Merchant Marine because a lot of the things that the Merchant Marine uses, the Navy uses. Shipbuilding facilities, ship repair facilities, an acknowledgement of what shipping does. It's soft power in the Merchant Marine versus hard power in the U.S. Navy. What was Captain Phillips and Tom Hanks doing on the Marisk, Alabama? They're delivering food aid. It's cargo preference. It's all these things that are out there. And right now we're seeing a lot of attacks directly on the U.S. Merchant Marine, whether it be uh, the existence of a U.S. Merchant Marine or the Jones Act or cargo preference. All those are, are happening right now. And again, the U.S. does not need its own merchant marine to carry its own goods. It doesn't. Look at most nations around the world. They don't. However, most nations don't control a quarter of the world's global uh, worth. They don't have a military presence across the, the globe. They have not ensured the free movement of cargo for every nation around the world. The end of World War II, the U.S. was moving 63% of the world's freight. It could have maintained that position if it wanted to. It didn't. Matter of fact, it sold off its merchant fleet to re-equip allied merchant fleets and provided Marshall Plan loans so that shipyards around the world could be rebuilt to a better technology than American shipyards. And we forget that at times. All right. Let's go ahead and jump over to story number four. Story number four, man, I've been talking a lot of gas recently, and and uh, I'm going to keep talking gas here because it's one of those big stories that is just dominating the news. And as we head into winter, just had our first frost here in North Carolina, uh, we're going to see this issue of energy be really important. This story right here, again, in GCAP, and this one's from Reuters, dozens of LNG carriers back back up off European ports waiting to unload. So the shutdown of Nord Stream 1, the failure to open Nord Stream 2, now the sabotage, and Europe's decision to curtail natural gas shipments via pipelines across Belarus, across Ukraine, and through Turkey have basically required Europe to become dependent on natural gas from America. Problem is there's not a natural gas pipeline from the United States to Europe. Instead, what you have to do is liquefy it. That means making it really, really cold. What I'm talking about is minus 260 degrees Fahrenheit, about minus 165 Celsius. I think it's right around there. You got to put it on a ship. You have to sail it across. And then you don't just offload it into a pipeline. You have to regasify. And this means there has to be regasification uh, process in place or facilities in place either a mobile ship that does that or shore-based facility that does it. And then there has to be some storage facilities to hold all either the liquefied natural gas or the compressed natural gas. And when that doesn't happen, when there's not enough facilities, you get what we get right now. And that is a backlog of LNG carriers off the coast of Spain. There are more than 35 LNG laden vessels off Spain and around the Mediterranean with at least eight vessels anchored off the Bay of Cadiz alone. Traders, analysts, and sources at LNG ter terminals familiar with the situation said on Monday. Remember, I had a story the other day from Splash 24-7, Sam Chambers, freight or charter rates for LNG carries $450,000 a day. So not only is Europe paying for more expensive natural gas to be liquefied and then regasified, but now it's sitting on ships off the coast and every day it sits there, they're paying half a million dollars on top of the costs associated with that. That is a huge cost. Can I also talk about the risk and security problems with having LNG carriers just floating off your ports? These are massively dangerous vessels to have just sitting there. And let's not forget too, that we're seeing demand for this natural gas increase in places like China, so that when ships are just sitting there off Spain and Europe, they may sit there and say, you know what, I'm not going to do that. I'm going to go to China and deliver loads as quick as I can. You get companies like Chevron saying, hey, there's going to be strong demand in Europe driving LNG exports, but there has to be facilities ashore to handle it. 
And again, this Chinese dependence on LNG imports are worrying a lot of leaders. They don't like being dependent on liquefied natural gas coming from the United States. However, China has benefited greatly by this. Because China has been able to cut back on LNG consumption, they have sold their loads, the, the, the LNG loads they have purchased in the United States, and sold them in Europe for a great profit. I mean, they're, they're really making a lot of money. But China now has a pipeline from Russia. They're talking about a second pipeline coming in. They're also talking about getting LNG carriers coming through the Arctic, delivering from the Amal fields. And so there is a lot of potential here for China to diversify its energy imports. But again, LNG is going to be the big factor, but don't dismiss regular oil either. This story, ship owners expect crude tanker rates to stay strong despite Russian turmoil. Again, OPEC just announced curtailing 2 billion barrels a day in production, which means that oil has to come from somewhere else. And Russia is selling it. And not only are they selling it, but they're shipping it long distances, ton miles. That means it's expensive. That means you got to pay charter rates for it. The G7 is trying to cap the prices on this. I don't think that's going to work. I'm working on a video on that. But it is a complicated subject. I'm trying to make it as 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 as, as, as digestible as possible at, without it becoming a, a word soup of energy and shipping issues. But it is a complicated process. Add to the issue, it's becoming politicized in places like the United States with a recent Jones Act waiver being issued to bring a LNG carrier carrying American LNG on a foreign ship into Puerto Rico. And, you know, this does not need to be politicized right now. What we need is to come up with a coherent national maritime strategy. Is the Jones Act dated? Yeah, it's 202, it's 102 years old. Uh, well, but then again, the Constitution's pretty old too. And what have we done to that? We've amended it, we've changed it. It's what we need to do with the Jones Act. We need a Merchant Marine Act for the 21st century that deals with the changes that have happened in the maritime industry across the board, not just with coastal trade. So a lot going on there. Sorry, I don't mean to get on my soapbox about that, but I've been dealing a lot with this issue recently. If you follow me on Twitter, at MercogliannoS, you would know this. All right, let's go ahead to our last story. For story number five comes courtesy of my buddy John Conrad because he was talking about a subject that I found particularly interesting, and that's this one. Climate change decimates Alaskan snow crab fishery. So I, I'm not going to lie. I love watching Deadliest Catch, one of my favorite shows to watch all the time. Uh, I just, in awe of those guys and girls that go up on crab boats into the Bering Sea and do a job. I know a lot of people see that and think they can do it. You can't. Let me be clear. You have no idea how tough working in that environment is. Absolutely, those are hardcore merchant mariners working right there. Absolutely amazing job they do. Very dangerous all the time. But this story by John Conrad highlights a issue that is really interesting. The Alaska Department of Fish and, and Game said this week that it had to cancel the winter snow crab season in the Bering Sea for the first time ever. Authorities estimate that 90% of the population has been lost. Between 2018 and, and 2019, the Bering Sea was extremely warm and the snow crab population kind of huddled together in the coolest water they can find. They probably starved to death and, were not, uh, and there was not enough food. So... Does this mean the end of crabs? No, there are crabs out there, but the crabs are probably north of the Bering Sea in the Arctic, but you can't get at them because of the ice caps and issues about getting up there. Plus, it's a really long distance to go get. And, and so this issue means that for the first time, we've seen a cancellation of a crab season in the United States. Uh, it goes on here, Jamie Gohn, the executive director of the Alaska Bering Sea Crabbers, these are truly unprecedented and troubling times for Alaska's iconic crab fisheries and the hard-working fishermen and women, I should say, and communities that depend on them. He predicted that crab fishing families would go out of business. This is a big issue. Now, this doesn't matter if you believe in global warming or not. What we do know is the bottom of the Bering Sea has been warmer than it ever has been. And crabs like a certain temperature. And when that temperature isn't there, they huddle together, they eat all the food that's there. And when that food is out, they starve. And that's what we've seen happen here. 
this has massive ramifications on fishing and maritime uh, work around the planet. We're seeing this with global fisheries. We're seeing this in the harvesting of food, particularly with the Chinese merchant marine fishing fleet that goes around the world harvesting fish in huge numbers because China has an insatiable desire for fish and protein. They sit there off the 200 mile economic exclusion zone of, of countries and they go right along the line scooping and fishing up everything they can. And at times they violate that line because they turn off their IAIS, they go across the line and if there's not a fishery or coast guard or naval vessel out there to watch them, they will break the rules and do this. And there are other nations that do this around the world too. It's not just China. This is why the United States, the Navy, the Coast Guard has developed these new uh, uh, strategies for dealing with illegal fishing and have sent Coast Guard cutters and Navy vessels to help neighboring nations around the world to monitor this. This is a global issue and it needs to be dealt with. It has huge ramifications. So I gave you five stories today that really span the spectrum here. I, I think we, 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 we definitely covered a lot. We were talking about LNG. We're talking about the decline of the U.S. Navy. We're talking about falling container rates and stocks. And of course, we're also talking about Russia, Ukraine and uh, the issue with food stocks. Shipping impacts you even if you're sitting there in landlocked Nebraska it has an impact on you, whether you can get your crop into a truck, onto a barge, down the Mississippi to a ship to sail it halfway around the world, or if Russia, Ukraine can't get its grain out, what does that mean? Your grain's worth more money than ever before, but it doesn't do you any good if you can't get it out of Nebraska. And that's what we're seeing right now. This is the impact that global shipping has on everybody. Hope you enjoyed today's episode. If you did, hey, take a moment, subscribe to the channel, hit the bell. We're over 62,000 subscribers. I'm shocked, floored, flabbergasted, and very appreciative to everybody who subscribes. Please do so. Hit that bell so you'll be alerted about new videos as they come out. Hey, leave a comment. Let me know what you like and didn't like about the video. I know people love my shirt, but what else? What else did you like about it? What did you not like about it? Give it a thumbs up. Share it across social media. Sharing is one of the best ways you can help spread the word of what's going on with shipping. And then the last way is contribute to the channel. How do you do that? Very simple. That super thanks button below allows you to contribute directly to the channel, or you can come over and join my Patreon. I have some great patrons of this page. Unheralded. I don't appreciate them enough, and that is my fault. You all allow me to get subscriptions to uh, maritime sites that are behind paywalls so I can stay abreast of all this. You help fund a lot of the conferences I go to where I learn a lot and meet people. Uh, you also help me put together this videos all the time with the hardware and software that's required. I appreciate it. I don't have to teach extra classes. I can focus on bringing this product to you. So head on over to the Patreon. You'll see a link at the very end of this video or down in the show notes, and you can become a monthly or yearly subscriber. We have different levels starting at $2 all the way up. Any little bit helps, and I greatly appreciate it. Till our next video, this is Sal signing off.